Rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, is a disease affecting millions worldwide. In this video, we'll discuss what is currently known about the pathogenesis of RA and how it relates to the challenges clinicians face when choosing the appropriate therapeutic approaches for their patients. Rheumatoid arthritis is one of the most common immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. Patients present typically with symmetrical polyarthritis of the hands and feet, and seropositive patients will also present with autoantibodies. But this is a systemic disease, and so rheumatoid arthritis involves many other organs and systems as well. Morning stiffness is a common clinical sign of almost all forms of inflammatory arthritis. However, morning stiffness lasting longer than 30 minutes is typically seen in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Most people diagnosed with RA are between age 30 and 70, and women are two to three times more likely than males to develop the disease. While it is not known exactly what causes rheumatoid arthritis, genetic factors such as the presence of variant HLA-DR alleles and specific environmental exposures such as smoking are part of the equation. Early diagnosis and treatment of rheumatoid arthritis are critical to improving quality of life and preventing irreversible damage. Rheumatoid arthritis is a clinical diagnosis. We need to see the patient and examine them. And what we look for is the number and location of the joints that would be involved with arthritis. Uh, we would look for the duration of the disease, looking for a disease that's present for six weeks or longer. We look for acute phase reactants, and we may get an x-ray to look for bone erosions. There are two different types of RA. To determine which type a patient might have, a physician will order serum laboratory tests. RA is divided into seropositive and seronegative, and if we want to see if the patient is seropositive, we would look for the presence of autoantibodies, and these would include rheumatoid factor and anticitrullinated protein antibodies, or ACPAs. Rheumatoid factor and ACPAs are not found in seronegative individuals, however, other types of autoantibodies may be present. In general, we view seronegative and seropositive as being really different diseases. The seropositive individuals have certain genes that they're associated with that are not found, for example, in seronegative uh, RA. And then disease severity is generally significantly worse in seropositive disease. They have more synovitis, more joint destruction, greater likelihood that they're going to require joint replacement sur uh, surgery. On the other hand, the way we treat them is actually quite similar. The preclinical stages of seropositive rheumatoid arthritis are characterized by disordered immunity, with a breakdown of tolerance and autoantibody production. There is a genetic predisposition in patients with RA, and people who have a first-degree relative with RA are at about a two to five-fold greater risk of getting the disease. These patients who are genetically predisposed may develop autoantibodies, they may develop ACBAs and rheumatoid factors, and this means that they are at risk for the disease, but they don't actually have the disease at that point. The mean duration of the preclinical phase of RA is typically about four years prior to the onset of disease, but in some patients, this may last 10 years or more. Patients may experience a second hit, perhaps from a viral infection that will precipitate active disease. Environmental triggers such as infections and notably smoking can result in disordered immunity, which may start at mucosal surfaces, such as the airway. Spurred by these changes, some proteins may undergo a modification called citrullination, in which an amino acid, arginine, is converted to citrulline. Within a predisposed individual, antigen-presenting cells see these proteins as foreign, bind to them, and migrate to the lymph nodes and mucosal lymphoid tissue. There, they activate CD4-positive T helper cells, which stimulate B cell proliferation and differentiation into plasma cells, which produce ACPAs and rheumatoid factor. Many of these immune cells migrate through the blood to the synovium, where they release pro-inflammatory cytokines, like interferon gamma and interleukins. This triggers neighboring cells, such as macrophages, monocytes, and synovial fibroblasts to release cytokines, notably TNF, IL-6, and IL-1. As a result, synovial fibroblasts proliferate, contributing to joint inflammation. As the disease progresses, abnormally proliferating synovial cells can cause a tumor-like growth, called panis, to develop, eroding cartilage and bone. Other bone destructive pathways also become activated, made worse by the inhibition of bone repair pathways. As a result, patients develop articular bone loss and systemic osteoporosis. 
Meanwhile, ACPAs and rheumatoid factor form immune complexes that activate the complement system, promoting chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation is accompanied by angiogenesis, which allows additional trafficking of immune cells to the joints and produces additional pro-inflammatory factors, exacerbating existing processes. In RA, patients may experience unpredictable symptom exacerbations, called flares. Rheumatoid arthritis is a disease that can wax and wane. It, there are times when the symptoms are, uh, are either not apparent or patients are in remission or have low disease activity. And then there are other circumstances where oftentimes for reasons that nobody exactly understands, uh, um, the disease will suddenly flare either generally or only in a few distinct uh, joints. The, the actual mechanisms for how one goes from, say, remission or low disease activity to a flare are not certain. A 2020 study showed that in the weeks leading up to a flare, circulating B cells become activated, followed by the appearance in peripheral blood of pre-inflammatory mesenchymal cells, or prime cells. Prime cells appear about a week before a flare and are hypothesized to migrate into the synovium to trigger inflammation. Therapies have improved dramatically in the last three decades with the advent of targeted approaches. However, choosing the most effective therapeutic strategy for each patient can be challenging. Individual patients with RA appear to have different pathogenic mechanisms, and we base this on the fact that patients will respond either, for example, to an anti-TNF and not to an anti-IL-6, or they may respond to a T-cell co-stimulatory inhibitor and not to an anti-TNF. And so it does seem that patients have very unique uh, pathogenic mechanisms. And the important thing is to find the right drug for the right patient. We don't always have biomarkers or predictors of what pathway will be driving disease in a given patient. And so the trick is to get to the point where you have a patient on a medication that addresses their own particular pathogenic mechanism and gets their disease under control rapidly. There is now a large armamentarium of treatments for this disease, and these drugs have been revolutionary. DMARDs are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, and they control inflammation, prevent or slow joint destruction, and potentially reduce the risk of death if started early. There are three classes of DMARDs, conventional, biologic, and targeted synthetic. The conventional DMARD methotrexate, a folate antagonist, is usually the first-line course of treatment. Typically, rheumatoid arthritis will be treated with methotrexate, and about a third of the patients will respond to methotrexate alone. Methotrexate was first introduced uh, for the treatment of RA in the mid-1980s, and it was a huge breakthrough medication, and actually targets a number of pro-inflammatory pathways. Uh, probably one of the most important things it does is upregulates adenosine, which is an anti-inflammatory molecule, in the local inflammatory environment. What happens then is that there's suppression of multiple immune pathways. Uh, there's a decrease in the production of cytokines, including IL-1, IL-6, IL-8. Uh, there's a suppression of macrophage activation, uh, decrease in neutrophil recruitment, uh, and other pro-inflammatory pathways will be suppressed as well uh, by methotrexate. Biologic agents introduced in the 1990s may be used alone or in combination with methotrexate or other conventional DMARDs. Currently available biologics target T-cell co-stimulation, specific cytokines, or surface markers on B-cells to interrupt the cycle of inflammation. Biologics are proteins that require systemic administration, either by intravenous or subcutaneous routes. So there are many biologic agents that are now being used in rheumatoid arthritis. We have biologic agents that will target cytokines. For example, we have five biologic agents that target TNF and block its functions in the immune system. We have two agents that block the IL-6 receptor and therefore block the effects of IL-6 in this disease. We have agents that can deplete B cells. Rituximab is the example there. Uh, and we have agents that can block co-stimulation of T cells so that T cells don't become activated. And these are all very effective depending on the patient and their pathway of disease. A highly effective class of medications are the JAK inhibitors, a type of targeted synthetic DMARD. These drugs are small molecules that can enter the cell and interrupt cytokine networks by blocking signal transduction. So depending on how you design these inhibitors, 
you can interfere various patterns of cytokine signal. And they, it turns out that they're actually quite effective um, in blocking that communication system from the surface of the cell uh, into the interior of the cell and uh, work as well as uh, blocking the cytokines themselves. So in that way, you're actually able to um, block the effects not just of one cytokine, but of multiple cytokines simultaneously. Treating flares depends on multiple factors, including duration and localization. During rheumatoid arthritis flares, we have to make a decision. Um, one is whether or not we think the flare is going to be persistent. And if there's a persistent flare, it may mean that we either have to advance therapy with the agents that they're currently on, uh, or whether we need to change therapy. For example, if someone has a flare and they're on methotrexate, if they're not in the optimal dose of methotrexate and there's room to go in terms of the dosing, it's not difficult to increase that uh, dosing. On the other hand, if everything is maxed out and there's no room to go, then you may have to switch therapeutics. Other really important change uh, over the last 30 years is a concept which is called treat to target. And this is a concept that tells clinicians we need to get inflammation under control as quickly as possible and as effectively as possible. So we now have measurements for uh, identifying the level of inflammation in a patient, and these are called disease activity scores. And these disease activity scores will cover things like number of swollen joints, number of tender joints, maybe physician global, patient global assessment, uh, maybe acute phase reactants, and they give us a number. And with that number, we can actually follow the level of inflammation in a patient, and we can treat so that that inflammation is as low as possible. Now that we are able to control inflammation better, we are really looking for remission. And if we can't get remission, we want low disease activity. And we will modify our medication so that we get to that point. Although tremendous progress has been made in the last 30 years, there are several unmet needs in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. There are still patients who don't respond adequately to any of the medications available. Patients may go into remission, but could have a recurrence of their disease, perhaps from a discontinuation of their medications. This means that rheumatoid arthritis requires lifelong treatment. Despite this, clinicians remain optimistic. There have been huge advances in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis over the last 30 years. We have so many medications now to choose from that are really effective in getting inflammation under control. But what I'm most excited about is the possibility of disease prevention. We know that we can identify a patient at risk for RA. It, this may be a patient who has a first degree relative with RA, who is at genetic risk for the disease. These patients we can follow and we can potentially intervene to prevent the disease. And there have been a number of studies of prevention that have not yet actually gotten to the point of prevention, but we have been able to delay the onset of disease, which I think is very promising. And the possibility of intervening so early that we actually prevent arthritis from occurring at all is a real possibility now. And I think that's what I'm most excited about. I'm optimistic that we will be able to ultimately individualize therapy. There is something different about every patient with RA, and, and they all have their own form of the disease. I do think that we'll be able to stratify people, and I think we'll be able to do it with a blood test. We want, um, and I think we will achieve, a situation where clinicians can send up a blood test, and within the next few days, get an answer back and they'll say, this person needs an IL-6 inhibitor, for example. As researchers increase their understanding of the underlying pathogenic mechanisms of rheumatoid arthritis, new opportunities for individualized interventions that treat or prevent disease should emerge. So for those with RA, a timely diagnosis by an RA specialist, along with rapid control of inflammation through early and aggressive treatment, are the key to managing this disease. <laughs>